welcome to the town hall and welcome Ellie Hansen, uh, author, advocate, entrepreneur. We're going to let people in as we go along, but I am Lori Cohen, the director of the Beagle Alliance. We have Mary Pryor, who will wave, um, who is <laughs> the co-founder of Cage to Couch Rescue and uh, the Beagle Alliance volunteer and rescue director. And um, I'm just going to let people are still coming in. So I'm going to admit them. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm, I just took a quick pause for those who just joined. Um, I'm admitting everyone as we go along. So I'm going to right now say hello to everyone. Welcome. Thank you to many of you who have been to our town halls before. Again, thank you for joining us. Ellie Hansen is here, as I just said, uh, author, advocate, entrepreneur. She, I'm going to leave it to her now and just let people in as we go along. So um, thank you all for being here. And thank you, Ellie, so much for putting this presentation together. We're really excited. <laughs> well, thanks for inviting me. And I have my former laboratory dogs wandering around <laughs> in the background. So they might pop on the screen. Perfect. Um, so I wanted to talk about this issue because I attended a protest last year and it was the first actual protest I ever attended in my life. And it was for the Beagles um, at Innative. Um, and that was back in May, 2022. And it had such a profound effect on me. And we drove a really long way to get there. And there was something really empowering about being physically together with other people. So not just on the computer, you know, not just over the internet, but just physically being with a group of people, um, doing something, you know, trying to do something right was, it was amazing. And so I, I often think that we can't, or we shouldn't forget about like real world street activism, because I believe it has and can have a profound impact on whatever issue that we're trying to present, um, just being physically there. And so that's why I chose this topic today. And so a lot of these stories come from my book. Some of them come from just my real world experience. And I will go back in history just for a second and talk about Frances Power Cobb. I'm not, not sure if you guys are familiar with her, but she is the pioneer of the anti-vivisection movement. So she was born in Ireland in 1822. And obviously when vivisection started for science, um, even back then in the early 1800s, there was up there were uprisings for the same reason why there are uprisings still today because they they felt the same way back then as we do today even scientifically they 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 didn't believe that testing on animals equated to uh improvements for humans or even if they did they didn't believe it was morally Right. And so this argument goes so far back. And I had to talk about Frances Power Cobb because she kind of started this whole anti vivisection movement. Basically, um, she was born to an upper class family. And she first became aware of vivisection during a, um, her parents passed away. So she went on like a world tour on her own. And she visited Asia and Europe. And she was in Florence, Italy, and this was 1863, when a friend of hers, who was a doctor at Harvard University, alerted her to a professor um, who was doing dog experiments in Italy. And I guess this Harvard doctor had been into the laboratory, had seen the dogs in mangled conditions, suffering. And she immediately, Frances Power Cobb immediately drafted a petition. She collected 783 signatures 
and presented it to this professor doing the experiments. And basically, she did her best to make his life very difficult in Italy, and she succeeded. So because of the bad press, he actually um, left his laboratory in Italy and then uh, retreated back to his home country. Sorry, my dog is going to disconnect wires here. Come on, Mark. There you go. So um, she, she's somebody I really wanted to talk about. And she was a, um, a writer. And so she wrote extensively on vivisection. And she started what is known today as Cruelty Free International. So back then, it was known as the British Union for the Abolition of Vivisection. Today, it's Cruelty Free International. And she published pamphlets, handouts, she organized protests, and she set up campaign shops. So like in this picture that you're looking at, back then, you could rent shop space and set up whatever uh, issue you're trying to promote. In this case, um, anti-vivisection was highly debated, like highly protested back in those days, believe it or not. And um, so she set up campaign shops and this is just one of her campaign shops. I think it's pretty impressive. We don't do anything like this these days. So I think this photo says a lot. It's a It's an amazing photo actually. It's yeah. incredible, really. I got it, I bought a book. That's like no no longer in publication. I needed some early history for the book I was writing. And I bought this book that had these like priceless old anti-vivisection photos and history. So that's where this photo came from. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, so, so vivisection started in the United States in the 1860s and 1870s. And groups like the ASPCA jumped on it immediately, trying to stop it. Obviously, it they they couldn't stop it. It was full swing in America at that point. And it honestly, vivisection went unregulated in the United States until 1966, when President Lyndon Johnson signed into law the Laboratory Animal Welfare Act which is now known as the US Animal Welfare Act. And so that's a long time for animal testing to go unregulated. And what's really interesting is how the Animal Welfare Act originated. And it starts with the story of a Dalmatian named Pepper. And this story became very famous in Life Magazine and um, Slate magazine and um, the media back back then. So basically, Pepper belonged to the Lakavage family. Uh, they lived on a farm in Pennsylvania, and it was one of like three of their dogs. And uh, Pepper was a devoted family dog, and often went to work at a nursing home with the wife of the family. And one day. You know, they usually let Pepper out to do her business at the end of the night before bed. And one night, Pepper didn't come back. And they called and they called out into the darkness. No Pepper. And Pepper was a very loyal dog. And by the next morning, they realized Pepper was gone. And they searched and they talked to neighbors and they couldn't find Pepper and they learned from somebody who had seen a pickup truck load a Dalmatian to the back of the truck. And that's all the information they had to go by. But the family kept looking and looking and they had to become detectives. And they finally did found out that Pepper had been stolen for a research lab up in New York state where they did a cardiac experiment on Pepper and Pepper had died because the cardiac experiment had failed. And so that's what happened to Pepper. And so dogs were being stolen in the United States to be used for research labs. That's where a lot of the dogs came from back then. And so 
you know, people in neighborhoods started putting up signs saying, hey, we're on to you. You know, you're not going to get away with this. But that's just horrifying to me that that was where vivisectors got their dogs. They were family dogs that they stole. And so next picture, um, the Humane Society of the United States knew that this was going on. They knew people's dogs were getting stolen. And they were these, um, they were known as dog dealers. And so these people like, so uh, the gentleman here in this picture, the older gentleman, with his mouth open. That's uh, Lester Brown. And he was known as a research dog dealer. So he would steal dogs or breed dogs and sell them to research facilities. And the Humane Society had been researching this for a long time and finally had enough evidence to get law enforcement involved. So they raided his property. So this is his property. And I don't know if you can see all the pictures. There's like, I'm not sure if you can see all the pictures. Let's see. Yeah, there's about six pictures there. Is that what you're yeah. thinking of? Yeah. yeah. So um, Life Magazine published a huge expose on, on this, on these, put all these photos in Life Magazine, and they called it a, the concentration camp for dogs. And Americans were so upset about this that they sent in 80,000 letters so this was way, obviously way before email or anything easy. These were actual letters that they sent to their congressional representatives demanding action to protect, to protect animal research, but mostly to protect the dogs that were in research. And the Animal Welfare Act was passed largely as a result of this media exposure and the public's involvement by writing the letters. So I thought that was a poignant example of what protesting can do. And when we get involved in large numbers, what the effect can be. So it's a good example. So this next thing is, a, I'm gonna start with a video, but um, I'm gonna first talk about what we're gonna watch. Fast forward 50 years and PETA, did an undercover investigation at Texas A&M University. I'm not sure if you guys heard about this golden retriever um, dogs that were recently released from the university, um, but they had done, they exposed the lab back in 2016 for the first time. Basically golden retrievers were being bred at Texas A&M with a crippling and painful severe form of muscular dystrophy. And they'd been doing this for 40 years. And in those 40 years, no cure for muscular dystrophy has been developed still. And two Texas A&M students started a petition to end the experiments. And these students got over 200,000 signatures, these two students. And they started protesting. And there were many protests over the years, including celebrities, which you'll see in the video. And 500 physicians sent letters in saying this testing was unnecessary. And, and Texas A&M got 6 million messages from the public telling them to end the research. So the experiment officially ended in late 2022. So this is pretty recent that this ended. And I am going to play this video and hope you guys can see it. Oh, it's always fun to be arrested. <laughs> so 
I'm gonna have it over here. Okay, so that was, um, I don't know, that video gives me, gives me chills because, there we go. That, that video gives me chills just because I feel like those people are so brave to put themselves out there like that. Um, and the result was amazing, actually. So that's one recent example. And then this is the next recent example. This was a undercover investigation con conducted by the Humane Society of the United States back in 2019. And this was at the Charles River Laboratories in Michigan, which is one of the largest dog research facilities in the whole, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's this huge facility. And they were conducting toxicity studies for Corteva agroscience. So they were studying a fungicide. And so several dozen beagles were poisoned and killed by being force fed a fungicide. And while most of the dogs had already been killed by the time this undercover investigation hit the press, 36 beagles remained alive when this went live to the public. Over 500,000 people signed a petition to release the beagles so that they could, to end the test, it was an unnecessary test, um, and release the dogs for adoption that were still alive. And a week later, Corteva AgroScience ended the test and the 32 surviving dogs were um, released and adopted. So. That was a very successful, I mean, I remember when that went live on social media, it, it really blew up and I was, you know, I just was at the edge of my seat wondering what was going to happen to those beagles and it, it was a happy ending for them. And one of those beagle stories is in my book, mm. his name is Teddy and he's, yeah, he's living the life now. So, but yeah, um, everything that they did at this Charles River Laboratory was considered legal. So there wasn't anything they were doing that wasn't illegal, so. And and Charles River is really global and there's yeah. actually many private laboratories or the private lab laboratories that we've, you know, found so far in Canada, there, there are a number of them that work with Charles River. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think I just saw today Charles River is under investigation um, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Department for potentially importing monkeys illegally from Cambodia for their research. Really? I just mm. saw that. PETA said something about that today. So, yep. Um, so this is the protest that I was talking about that inspired me. Um, this was one that I went to. This involved another undercover investigation by the Humane Society of the United States. It involved the Innative Laboratories, which is in Indiana. And they were doing, Innative was doing testing for a company, a pharmaceutical company called Kinetics Pharmaceuticals. I don't know what drug they were testing it. You know, they don't tell you that. Um, but what the HSUS undercover investigation revealed were severe violations of the Animal Welfare Act, including um, one beagle had a very bad reaction to whatever drug they were injecting into him. And he um, salivating and couldn't stand and just suffering and no vet they called the vet and the vet was too busy to come euthanize the beagle and so that beagle spent 12 hours overnight suffering on the floor and um, that's a severe violation of the animal welfare act um, there was a lot of other ones as well involving other animals so but this particular protest was for 80 beagles that were using they were using to test this Krynetics drug. And they were gonna, they knew the date from the undercover investigation that these beagles were gonna be killed. So the undercover investigator knew that date. 
And that's what this protest was about, was to let the company know that we we wanted those beagles to be let free instead of killed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I signed the peti- I signed the petitions online and I felt like, oh my God, there's got to be something else I can do. You know, I just, I cannot sit here and just be at my computer. So I, I'm a volunteer for the HSUS. So I, I emailed the volunteer coordinator and I'm like, what else can I do? And she's like, well, there's a protest in San Diego, San Diego, California. So this was a Monday I emailed her and she's like, the protest is on Friday. Now, mind you, I live in Billings, Montana. So that is 1200 miles away from, from where I live. But I said to my husband, I'm like, what about a road trip (laughs) to San Diego? (laughs) It's only 1200 miles. And, um, yeah, we, we, we did, we left on, on Wednesday and it took us two days to get there. And we, we went to the protest and basically what the protest was, was, it was a surprise. So the media, I don't think was alerted until like maybe that morning, but basically all our job was, was to deliver these two boxes of petitions. There was 250,000 petitions in these boxes to deliver it to the pharmaceutical company. So we assembled about a mile away and a lot of us brought our dogs and we walked the mile to Carnetics Pharmaceuticals, which is a big fancy building. And they saw us coming and they locked the doors and they immediately got on their cell phones with very worried looks on their faces, I must say. (laughs) <laughs> and um, the signs were just to release the dogs. Some people had megaphones. I mean, some people were, this was my first protest, so I'm not, I'm a little shy. And so I wasn't like right in your face. I'm not in your face type of person. That's not my personality, but some people were. And But they, uh, yeah, they just locked the doors and, I don't know what they were on their cell phones talking or who they were talking to, but it was a pretty hot day. So we just sat in the shade and I think we spent just like an hour, just all hanging around out front of their building. And they knew we were there. Absolutely. And these are my dogs here in this picture. Uh, So for me, this was the most profound moment of this protest. Crinetics shared a parking lot. And I think part of their building was shared with a a different company. I don't know what company they they were, but they saw that we were protesting in the parking lot. And so what they did was they made quickly made signs and came out as a group to support us, like this whole office, who have whatever company they were working for. And they wanted to make sure that we knew that they supported us and that they didn't work at Crenetics. And I just thought that that was really powerful because these people, they didn't know about the protest, but they just stopped what they were doing. They wrote signs and they came to join us. And that was was one of that was one of the things that made it so empowering, I guess, that, you know, you're not alone. There's so many people in so many places that care about this just giving people an opportunity to do something. That's it, right? Make a sign. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. And it just goes to show you that sometimes people don't know and it's until you tell them what's happening and what's going on that they're outraged, right? Like a lot of it is simply not knowing. It's not apathy. It's just simply not knowing. Right. Or if you know you know, what are you going to do about it? So Mm -hmm. this kind of gave them something to do. It's a very simple thing. So yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, So this protest against Initiv was three-pronged. There was the one in San Diego. Then there was another one around the same time at the Initiv Laboratory in Indiana. So that's what this picture is. And 
the group in Indiana called their protest Wear Blue for Beagles Walk. And it was organized by the local humane societies over there. And protesters, they tried to speak to representatives of Initiative, but the police stopped them at the company gate. So they were not able to do that. And this was the third protest that happened at the Initiative headquarters in Maryland. And there was um, 30 people who protested outside and over a quarter of a million signed petitions were delivered to Initiv. 167 legislators from 32 states co-signed a letter asking for the Beagles to be released. And Initiv or Crinetics have never uttered a word to anybody. They never acknowledged anything. They, they've been, they were from the very beginning and to the very end completely silent about, they never issued a press release, nothing. Never communicated with the Humane Society at all. And believe me, they tried. So, so that was a super sad ending because all those beagles were euthanized. Mm -hmm. So despite all these efforts. Um, but I don't know, it was still, and to me, it was still worth doing it. I mean, I, going to that protest is something that, lit a fire in me it did and i want to keep doing that so um this is a global issue so every time i mean obviously canada united states but this is this is an issue that affects people around the world and um this is a pro, this is a protest that's happening in hamburg germany in 2019, this happened, and 13,000 people attended this protest. And they were protesting the Laboratory of Pharmacology and Toxicology that was accused of animal abuse. And of uh, they, were they had undercover investigators see abuse of dogs and monkeys in their facility. And so this is a huge turnout, you know, at the I, it's it's very heartening, and I I don't think this lab was shut down either, regardless of what of this protest. But I mean, look at the turnout of the mm -hmm. people. That's so, incredible. Yeah. And then this is another international example, and this this is unbelievable. In fact, if you don't know about my podcast, Dog Research Exposed, um. The leader of this protest is my next guest. So that will go live in March. And he is just one of my new favorite people. Basically, this is called Camp Beagle. And what you're looking at in this picture is MBR Acres, which is actually Bio Marshall Resources. Mm -hmm. This is an American company that has global facilities. This is their facility in Cambridgeshire, UK. So it's out in the country in the middle of nowhere. It's hidden on purpose. If you drive by, you probably wouldn't know it was there. But these are um, all sheds where beagles specifically are bred for research. And at any time, there's 2,000 beagles in these sheds. So this protest, Camp Beagle, has been out front of MBR Acres for over 18 months. Mm -hmm. It's been a so very- So basically, long. yep. And so um, there's always people there, which is which is unbelievable. I, I mean, I don't wanna give away my podcast episode, but basically people come from all over the world mm -hmm. to camp here. And it's complete with food, toilets, I mean, uh, a kitchen, whatever you need just to stay and protest. So this is another photo of people protesting outside. And what's really sad about this is um, they call them the death bands. I guess being there is very emotional because about once a week, these white windowless vans are loaded with 
beagle puppies who are taken off to research laboratories. And we all know what happens to them in there. Mm -hmm. So people who camp at Camp Beagle uh, witness that, it's it gets very emotional. Let's just put it that way. How can it not? You okay. know what I mean? So stuff like this happens. Uh, I guess the, the police are not... Camp Beagle operates within the law very strictly. However, the police do everything they can to try to give them a hard time. So this is the this is a picture of Camp Beagle. And I ask myself, would I be comfortable with pushing boundaries like this? You know, you know, I believe in, I mean, personally, obviously nonviolent, but you know, it's, I don't know, this picture says a lot. And mm -hmm. how many of us would be comfortable putting ourselves right in the middle of this? It's just a question to ponder. You know, there's no right or wrong answer, I don't think. It's just, that's Camp Beagle. Um, so I put together some quotes that I thought had a lot of meaning on this topic. So this is Martin Luther King Jr. And he helped bring about the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in the US and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And because of him, each of these bills helped African-Americans access civil rights in the United States. Um, this is one of his quotes. And this picture also gives me chills if you look at the number of people mm -hmm. who attended his protest for what we all know is the right thing. He, he was doing the right thing. He was fighting for, for just, you know, that's what he was doing. And the fact that he could get that many people to come is inspiring. So that's one. And then this next quote up above really impacted me because I, I recently listened to a podcast that she was a guest on. Her name is Amanda Ripley. She's a journalist and a trained conflict mediator. And she's spent her life uh, reporting in war-torn countries and, you know, the worst, the worst of places. And she, her quote is, we need conflict to get better, to be challenged, to challenge each other. In fact, I think the U.S. needs a lot more good conflict, not less. There's no better shortcut to transformation that I know of. And the photo here I chose was Greta Thunberg, who is really one of my heroes because she became an environmental act activist at age 15. And she's one of the world's best known climate campaigners. I think she's only like 20 years old now, somewhere around there. And she inspired 4 million people to join the global climate strike on September 20th, 2019 in what was the largest climate demonstration in human history. And just to watch her, she's just, just a little girl, get that many people to come to care is completely inspiring. She is completely inspiring. And I feel like when I look at this picture, I'm like, what do I feel? I said, I feel like animal testing needs this. Like we need all those media cameras and then we need someone to speak like her. And we need, we need a huge group of people like that. That's what I feel like we need. <laughs> I don't even know how to start to accomplish that, <laughs> but wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that be awesome? You know what I mean? That's what I feel. So um, I was wondering, well, how would you, how would someone who's never organized a protest, where do you start? So I found a great resource for um, anything you need to start off. It's from an organization called Rise for Animals. They were previously the New England Association Against Vivisection or something. So they've been around, this group has been around for a really, really long time. And uh, they changed their name not too long ago. But if you wanna go 
figure out how to start a protest, they have very detailed instructions. And it's just right at that website on the bottom. So, <clears throat> and then if you're interested, a lot of the stories I told today came from my book. Half of the book are stories of rescued research dogs. So happy stories. And so if you are interested in learning more, this is a compre comprehensive uh, book about animal testing, specifically dogs from the very beginning to today. So if you're interested in that, and then this is my podcast and it's available on all podcast apps, the most popular ones. And we, I put out a new episode every month and I'm interviewing professionals from all different aspects of this debate. So scientists, uh, street activists, uh, rescue groups. Um, so it, every month is something different and it's educational. So it's not a lot of banter or talking. It's more like an interview format. So it's meant to be very educational. And uh, I don't have anything else. I wanted to leave some time for questions and answers or discussion or whatever you guys do <laughs> for town hall. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Ellie. That's uh, it's the photos were powerful as are the events and uh, and Camp Beagle is really something else. I'm not sure who hasn't seen that at this point because it's right. gone on for so long, but I will just open it up. So if anybody wants to ask Ellie any questions or has any comments, I'm trying to copy in the links. Uh, a little bit while you were speaking there, Ellie, just so people could copy and okay. paste the links too. Um, but by all means, please, um, you know, unmute yourselves and and uh, if you have any questions or comments for Ellie. And Mary, um, actually, while we're chatting here, Mary, maybe you want to introduce your celebrities while while we're. <laughs> <laughs> yeah of course they're sound asleep now i but... can actually i'll go back to that slide perfect too. yeah perfect <laughs> <laughs> she's sound asleep <laughs> that's minnie <laughs> she's the one tilting her head maria is not to be seen right now she's <laughs> wandering the house so <laughs> wake up minnie and Mary, what's what? Why don't you share a little bit of their story and and the, how they came to be with you? Yeah, so they were actually they were um, in the laboratory until they were like over ten years old, um, and they actually were in China, um, and they were both came out. They were rescued by Beagle Freedom Project, and they came out blind we don't know at what point they went blind in the lab but the lab whatever they did to them made them blind both she and maria um and so i had i don't know i my dog had was about 10 or 11 years old when she passed away and i thought i'll just foster for a little bit and then um i just kind of remembered about beagles being tested on and everything so i applied at beagle freedom project and they had just rescued Minnie and so they asked if I'd be interested in taking her so I met her thinking I'd just foster her and believe me like they put her in my arms and I was like oh my I'm adopting her she's coming home with me <laughs> so and then Maria came over a few months later because she was pregnant at the time when they rescued her from the lab and she couldn't travel um, so she had her puppies in China and then um, she came over like on Mother's Day um, in 2018 is when they arrived she with I think four of her puppies and um so I fostered her and it was like she and Minnie were meant to be together I don't know if they knew each other over there or what it was like but um they got along so well so we just kept Maria too and adopted her so and now <laughs> so it was 2018 so now they're coming up on 15 16 years old now they're both pretty uh, Maria's almost completely deaf and Minnie's pretty deaf too so 
they have kind of kind of isolated little worlds and all but mm -hmm. they love going for walks they always feel secure when they're on a leash you know knowing that they can't bump into anything that we're there to protect them and everything so they go for a long walk every day and they're doing really well so they are they so are laura i see you're so polite with your hand up <laughs> Laura, I, I can't put my camera. Oh, on that's right. You know my issue. Yes, yes. Laura's <laughs> one of our volunteers, so yes, we know Laura. Yeah, her internet, your internet. My, I don't know how mine's still going, but yes, I I know <laughs> yours is great. Yeah. So rural internet, yeah, not good at all. So the last time I had my camera on, my face was frozen. So I'll never do that again. But um. Uh, how much time do we have? Because I'm just going to say, Ellie, I am a huge fan of your podcast. I just started listening to it and I shared it and I'll continue to share. Thank and you so much. That means a lot because. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, you just started following me on one of my Instagram accounts. So I was like, yay. Well, <laughs> so but um yeah no like this is totally um a branch that I want to get into I was just I emailed Lori the other day and I was like I really need to get into the political activism side of things you know like you know, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm still going to be a volunteer with the Beagle Alliance, but like, I really want to rally people up. Um, so yeah, this, I, I've written everything down. I'll, I'll soon be making, and I really liked what you said, because I, I'm going to be starting with a Facebook group, but I really, really want to make it engaging. And I really want it to be more than just, um, more than just care about the issue you know a couple of neighbors they're like yeah i know that's so sad it's like no 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 <laughs> don't stop there let's take action you know let's write to our representatives um i yeah i spent i think i comment i spent saturday night writing to my uh member of parliament um that's how i spend my saturday nights now and I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm very happy to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. I really liked what you said that it's a global issue because I think when I start the Facebook group, I mean, the focus will be, you know, legislation in Canada, but I think we would all greatly benefit from comparative models and what's going on in different countries and, you know, compare, you know, like, um, the EU has voted to end animal testing by a certain date, like 2030, is it 2035? But I don't think Canada is anywhere near that with legislation. So basically, I'm just saying, I'm your girl. I'm going to get things <laughs> done, Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I'm not Thank sure. You. Thanks, Laura. I'm not sure how much you know, um, Ellie, but we in Canada, we are mm -hmm. lacking in legislation here. So legislation is a is a huge deal here. We don't have the oversight like the, you know, FDA and the like we, we don't have a federal legislation. So everything's provincial that touches on animal pr um, protection and nobody, no province except for the Ontario Research Act really talks about uh, research animals so it's it's just mm -hmm. an untouched subject wow. and the regulatory the so-called regulatory body the Canadian Council on Animal Care is um is actually unregulated itself so it receives government funding laboratories who follow their guidelines receive government funding so it's in their best interest to to um you know, be a member and and uh, be approved by this body, but there's no nobody's coming in to audit. None of the audits really are 
uh, released. Uh, we, we can't go and find private labs in Canada. There's not a list of them anywhere. They're, they're very yeah. hidden. Um, wow. Yeah, it's, it's a very secretive world, the private lab world, and then the public, like the university research centers that, um, you know, do have animals, they're still pretty quiet about it. Um, but they're basically regulated by an unregulated body. So there's just simply not a lot of accountability uh, in, in that world here in Canada. And so we've got a lot of work to do. I, I'm, I love that I love this subject because it happened to, and I, I it just actually worked out this way. It happened to coincide with a letter writing campaign that we just launched where we are asking, can, not just Canadians, I say Canadians, but it really doesn't matter who writes because as you say, it's a global issue. And, and I, I don't, I don't think it matters who's emailing and asking who, where to release these animals. You don't have to be a Canadian to write to Canadian institutions, but we just started a letter writing campaign to ask um, the research labs and the universities to, to consider rehoming the animals. We know, we all know that many of the animals uh, can go on to live amazing lives. They don't have to be euthanized. So there's no reason for them not to, to re to release them really. Yeah, we, I, a lot, a lot of people just, I mean, I, th I think, well, what the heck does it matter what I write? You know, who's going to care about what I write, but actually it does matter. You know what I mean? It really, it really does. And, you know, what did it matter that I drove to that protest in San Diego? I, yeah, it didn't fix the problem, but it was more, it was, it was more than that. So I don't think you have to have 13,000 people at a protest to make an impact. I know we had an impact that day with that small, that group that we had. Mm -hmm. And so I think putting it into perspective, like every letter, every body matters. Like you, like you said, before we started, you never know what that one person could change. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we talked about this earlier and Mary and I spoke about this earlier in the week is that, you know, sometimes you look, and I think that's, this is true of every, all of us in our lives with all types of subjects, you know, or whatever we're going through, we look at what's going on now and it seems overwhelming and it sometimes seem, seems futile. And we think, well, if I just do this one thing, it's not really going to make a big deal because we're looking at this big issue that seems so overwhelming but if every seed planted, it's just, it's a seed planted and you have to just do that. So if one person writes, if two people write, if somebody shows up here, if somebody mentions this to a friend, we just have to think of it as planting seeds and you just don't know where, where and when that harvest is going to come in, but you're doing, you're planting and you're planting and you just have yeah. to know that at some point, you know, there's going to be that tipping point. And that's what we all hope for when, you know, when you're an advocate, that's, that's what you're doing. You're hoping for that and waiting for that and believing in that. Yeah. So I hope, yeah, I hope to be part of another protest here. One of these days, we'll see what happens in the U S here. Exactly. There's some inklings of something that could go down. I don't know the details yet, but Okay. <laughs> I'll be there. I'll be on a plane and I'll be there. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? I know we're coming up on our hour here. So I just want to see if anybody else and sorry, sometimes I miss the, the, um, the hand, the zoom hand. So I'm just taking a little look here. Um, okay. Well, Thank you, Ellie. I did pop in. Oh, Chris, hold on. One of the worst laboratory. I want. I just want to read your note here, Chris. One of the worst laboratories for the sort of torture. Um, MPR, MBR supplies them with beagles weekly. If MBR was to cease operations, it it, it totally would. M yeah. Oh, I, yeah. In fact, a huge is in up upstate New York. Right. They have come up in private labs in Canada, too. So they supply some of the private labs in Canada as well. So they are just global then. Yeah. 
Yep. And they're very secretive and very hidden. Yep. 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 Exactly. Okay. Well, I did copy some links in, um, in case everybody wants and wants to check in on uh, Ellie's podcast. So I put the links in there to make it easier, possibly. Um, feel free, anybody, to email info at thebeaglealliance.org if you have any questions after the fact or if you want the links and didn't grab them or, or just, you know, want us to ask Ellie something. And of course, you're on Instagram and, uh, and your book is available where, Ellie? Oh, Amazon. Oh, pardon uh, me, right there, Barnes and Noble. I'm obviously not paying attention today. Sorry. It's right in front of us. Minnie and Maria say if anybody would like a potographed copy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Definitely. I would be willing to do that. <laughs> awesome. I love, that. I love that they're on the cover. <laughs> they're so <laughs> with the too. famous, the famous head tilt, the yeah. totally famous yeah. head tilt. Iconic head tilt. Yeah. For anyone that doesn't know, um, Minnie and Maria have their own social media presence as well. So if you guys want to go look at that, please do. <laughs> please do. You know what's true too is that I should have said this because the idea that Maria was pregnant, so she was 10 years old and blind and in a laboratory and pregnant. Like, could they be any more terrible to a dog? Right. You know? Yeah. That's just I when I think of it, oh my God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I don't know. Um, this is a question. I'll just I'll just mention this too, but this is a question that ca came up a lot for Mary and I when we were both working in the rescue department for Beagle Freedom Project, is we would a lot of the fosters and adopters would come back um, you know, months or sometimes years later and and ask about health issues and ask us what was done in the laboratory and and that's a this is a you know we've answered this question a lot of times where it's they do not tell us what happens in the laboratory they there's not a laboratory that is willing to disclose that kind of information because they want to keep that pretty quiet and secretive but um yeah that's a question we've gotten a lot where we've had to say we're we simply are not privy to that they would never tell us that so that's that's hard for first fosters some fosters and adopters because you know of course we all try to do our best to prevent and keep our animals healthy and and you know all of us don't know the future of health for anybody and any of our animals but it's a little it's a little daunting for some people to think like that especially if you're trying to do prevention and take care of your animal and you're not quite sure what could come up because of what was done to them in the laboratory you know 2 years or 5 years later yeah. Sad. But anyway, um, thank you, everybody. I'll just end this now because we're at, well, 7, 8, 8.30. We're at a variety of time zones, but <laughs> we're an hour in. So I just, Dave, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I think Dave had his hand up. Did you see Dave? Dave, sorry, Dave did Dave, did you have or... your hand up and I missed you? Apologies. Yeah, it's okay. No worries. Oh, I mean, go if you got to go, you got to go. No, go for it. Go ahead. Okay, so I just had a quick question. Um, I live in Montreal and I've participated in some protests here. There's a few labs that test on beagles and uh, we have a beagle, so it hits home. Um, my question is though, because this protest that I visited, they were going on for a while, like months. Every Friday they would show up to this lab and have to stand across the street, but they would protest. And like they had media coverage at the beginning, eventually that weaned off. They're, the labs are still running, they're still doing their thing. Is it worth it, do you think, more to put the effort towards government bodies or actual private labs? Are you? Uh, I, have a I have a comment about this. <laughs> Go for it, Laura. Yeah. Okay. That, Dave, I think that's, I think about that too. I think that's a really interesting question. There's an, there's an excellent episode on Ellie's podcast. Um, there's an organization down in the U S that has a very interesting way to go about it. 
And what they're doing is they're not focusing on the private labs. What they're doing is they're focusing on government funded um, tests and showing how cruel, but also how unnecessary and wasteful of taxpayer money it is. And so like my first target is Health Canada. Um, there's an article by the CBC. Now the headline is very misleading. It says Health Canada to stop uh, toxicity testing on beagles. That is a very misleading headline because when you read the article, they're not stopping. They're stopping doing the six month long testing. And they're now just making it three months because they can already see the damage done to the dogs in just three months. So I think what's a really interesting um, strategy is to expose the government, Health Canada, and our tax money being spent on this when it wasn't our choice. So Dave, I kind of, um, I agree with you. I'm wondering if like that could be a, it, well, I think all strategies are valid. I think all course, strategies course, are valid, but anything... I think this would be another strategy. Yeah, like, I mean, for sure, doing anything is better than nothing. But I just think that at the end of the day, let's say you guilt one lab into shutting down. It's like another one's just going to pop up. It's not going to end until the law is changed. Agreed. I, I, I completely, sorry, agreed. That, I'm so sorry. I completely agree. Um, I'll put my Instagram uh thing up <laughs> in the chat <laughs> i completely agree i specifically want to start a facebook group exactly to go after legislation oh, exactly yeah i i think that's a great question i think your question is great dave that's a, just such a great question and i think it's a, a really good question as a canadian because of the secrecy that is animal testing in Canada. I mean, most people, we're at the point where most people don't even know there's animal testing in Canada. We, you know, as a country, we believe that that only happens in the big bad United States and it could never happen in Canada and it doesn't happen here. And that's the, and, and I'm literally talking verbatim the, the conversations I've had with numerous people. You're I, right. And your point about the regulation body not being regulated we're worse than the states. Oh, way we're worse. worse most we're not. Most yeah. places in the world. Absolutely. We're not even in the same league. The, it's, the, it's, the United States is so far ahead. We yeah, think we're so We think we're so yeah. fucking good. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a shame because it's, it's really, it's such a facade when it comes to animal protection um, and, and really, and not only is it unregulated, it's literally secretive. So, which makes it even more, you know, insidious really, um, as a country, right? Because there's no transparency yeah. going on, but I your think, question, I think Lori, uh, I'm sorry, I forget her name, but pointing out to the taxpayers that are the, the amount that we're losing to this, but also that they're paying towards it. Yeah, an extra is a guilt layer. It's an extra guilt layer that, that could be useful. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And and I think, I think that uh, I also believe that, I mean, when you look at our letter writing campaign, the majority of the institutions up there are um, government funded research universities. And that's for two reasons. Number one, we could find them. Right. Like the, the private labs, we know of a handful, but some are in the backyards all over rural, you know, Canada that we don't know. And, and we, that's why we say to people, if you know of a lab near you, a private lab, please tell us because, you know, all of the um, advisors and, and all of the people in animal welfare, like Camille Labchuk and, and uh, you know, Dr. Chandra Sakara, we, we've asked them, where are some of these labs? And they're like, that's going to be your tricky part of this is finding them so you know even people who have been in the animal welfare world in Canada for for years and years are unaware of where you know these private labs are housed so you know I think targeting and speaking with the funded um 
research labs is important because first off, people are sending their student, you know, students are going there. People, people like there, there's a degree of in the public eye that these institutions are in for a variety of reasons that are not just animal testing or using animals, etc. So I think that by exposing some of these places where people spend their money to send their children to go to school and, and people take student loans, and there's all sorts of things that can go on that you could say, look, why do you want to give your money to this institution that is you know, causing these animals to suffer. So I think in Canada, we need to start with the public institutions first. And again, that doesn't mean that we just kind of shove the private labs off to the side. I think it's always worth hitting them all up, which is why we have them on our site. Um, and we're looking for them. But definitely, I think there's a greater impact. And if we can get some animals out of these places they really are the ambassadors. They, they, you know, when you see that these dogs go on to live and, and many of us have dogs in our homes that have been abused and et cetera. And when you see how love and patience and kindness can heal them, how can anybody want to see that go on in their country and pay for it on top of it? Yeah, I think the saddest part about the the actual choosing of beagles for the testing. Like we know they're docile and th that's one of the reasons they do it. But if anybody who has a beagle, they know how much they love their comfort and how picky they are about temperatures, how much they love to be petted, the attention. And it's like, you choose the most like kind hearted dog who like just wants to chill and you put it through hell. Like if it, it fucking I'm not, sorry for swearing again, but it just really <laughs> pisses me off. So yeah. I, I want this, like, I, I want to, I'm actually changing my career to get into political science. And like, I, I just want to do whatever I can to make this not be a thing. Um, um, thank you. <laughs> Dave, please find me because I don't want to do this alone. I've already <laughs> written to my MP four times. Where and are you? I just what, what feel province? I'm in Ontario. I'm near Toronto. I'm near okay. Toronto. So, I grew up in yeah. Burlington. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. And I have a poli sci background. So as cool. my undergrad. So yeah. Yes. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. Nice to meet you, Dave. I, I think, Dave, you should uh, hop on our volunteer track too. So maybe we should all be talking. Yes. <laughs> sure, <good>. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, well, um, I'm going to I'm going to end this if that's okay. And I would love to chat with you guys. I mean, please email us. We can we can always get together. And and uh, and of course, we're always working on getting volunteers together. And uh, and we can do this, you guys in Canada. I you know we just have to make people aware. That's the first step. And then we mo keep moving forward. And and we don't give up. And we let these institutions know that we're not giving up. And and you know we're really just getting started in Canada, as I say, because people don't know. But that's why we're here. And and we can collectively do this with our community. And and we have a lot of people in the United States who support this as well, who are just over the border, who are rooting for us because they know that, you know, they've made so many strides in the States and, and we can do that too. We're very behind. So, yeah. So thank you all. Thank you for being here. Um, Ellie, thank you so very much for everything you're doing and for putting this together for us. And I hope everyone will love join. being here. Thank you. No, Thank you I so much. appreciate it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I hope you weathered some of our Canadian chat, but we really are behind here. And, and it's wonderful to hear what people are doing in the States. And, and I was privileged to work uh, for BFP in the States. So I know how advanced and how much further ahead the US is. And but I also have faith in Canadians. And I know that it's this is a powerful subject for many and, and we just have to get it out there and moving. So thank you all from Canada and the US who are here. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. Um, best of luck, Ellie. Hopefully we'll talk again. Maybe meet in Montana on a little yep. visit to kindness. Not that far. Yeah, <laughs> not that far. Exactly. <laughs>
Anyway, and uh, everyone else, please check out our next town halls. We've got a few good ones coming up. So uh, always a pleasure to see everyone. And we really are grateful for you guys attending. So thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, thank you, Lori. Thank you, Ellie. Yeah. And don't forget to email us info at thebeaglealliance.org if you want to connect and, and chat again or have any questions. So thank you all. Have a great evening. Thank you. Take thank care. you. Good night. Good night.